I, you know, thank you very much everyone for coming on board uh, to watch. Um, it's always fun to, uh, to share with the department. I'm so used to speaking, you know, all over the place and uh, virtually all over the place the past uh, nine months. Um, I uh, kind of put something new together. So I'm trying out some new material on you guys. Uh, this is uh, talk is about precision medicine and rhinoplasty. And um, I have uh, no disclosures uh, other than to say, um, this is a how to do a better rhinoplasty talk. But before you all turn off your computers, um, I wanna say that it's maybe not exactly what you think when, when I say that. This, this isn't gonna be so much about the technical, technical aspects of doing things because I don't know how interested you'd be in that. I wanna talk a little bit about other aspects of it. And really it's a summation of uh, a lot of, uh, of research, uh, clinical research done. I'm gonna highlight stuff that I've done, but I'm gonna talk about folks, other folks stuff. Uh, and I wanna acknowledge that um, some of this was funded by the Wong Family Fund and the Duca uh, Fund, uh, which have generously um, given uh, to my research program here uh, while I've been at Stanford. Um, so, you know, the precision medicine is, a, is this idea and this, this word that this pair of words has been thrown around a lot the past five years. And you look at the definitions, you know, there are various definitions online. Uh, the first is that uh, precision medicine is a medical model that proposes the customization of healthcare with medical decisions, treatments, practices, or products being tailored to a subgroup of patients rather than a one drug fits all model. Um, alternatively, and more succinctly, uh, it can also be defined as referring to the tailoring of medical treatment to the individual characteristics of the patient. And well, we'll sub I'll submit to you that the first one, you know, really is what, the, what we think about when we think about precision medicine, cancer therapies that are tailored genetically to uh, you know, patients and so on and so forth. The bottom uh, definition is one that really um, kind of broadly defines it, I think, more accurately uh, and is something that we've been doing in facial plastic surgery forever. We always individualize our treatment. It's really uh, a question uh, for us um, of fine tuning that uh, in order to get the optimum results for our patients. And I hope one of the things that you'll get out of uh, tonight's session is understanding just what a challenge we face as facial plastic surgeons um, in trying to more precisely treat uh, our patients with uh, various things, uh, reconstructive or aesthetic. And I'm gonna talk about rhinoplasty uh, this evening. So, you know, the key, uh, in fine tuning a medical therapy is understanding and diagnosing the disease process more accurately. Um, and then uh, being able to measure outcomes. You're not gonna be able to fine tune things unless you can do those really well. And I think that's where a lot of the challenges uh, in rhinoplasty come around. Uh, and um, you know, if you think about what this means for rhinoplasty, you may think it just means uh, taking uh, a nose and making it look prettier. Uh, this is the sort of the common idea when we talk about rhinoplasty, and this is the only before and after I'm gonna show you the entire evening. So, you know, this is not your typical rhinoplasty talk, like, like I said it a few minutes ago. Um, who judges whether this is a good result and how do you judge it? Are, do you make quantitative measurements? Um, is it, are there some ideals that we're looking for? What about the airway? I mean, that's the other part of the equation. It's more than just the aesthetics. Um, because there's, there's a tension in rhinoplasty and, and we've been preaching this for all 18 years of my practice and, and you know, in the 90s, just when I finished up my training, it really wasn't necessarily thought of that way. Um, every aesthetic patient that comes in the door, you must think about your long-term results in terms of destroying function. Uh, so you must preserve it. And every functional patient, you need to think about what you're doing to them aesthetically as well, because they may be unhappy about things you do in that sense. So it's a balance and it's a tension in these patients whenever you see them. Uh, and you have to balance all of this stuff. Um, I'm gonna talk first about nasal airway obstruction. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about aesthetics. Now, in terms of nasal airway obstruction and, and nasal function, um, I'm sorry, in terms of nasal function, I'm talking about nasal airway obstruction. Uh, with all due respect to Dr. Patel, if she's on this, uh, and others uh, in the rhinology department uh, division, uh, you know, I'm talking about anatomic airway obstruction. I realize there are other functions such as olfaction and filtration and heat exchange and things like that. But I'm gonna talk about nasal airflow. Uh, and the, the big uh, dichotomy here is that 
you know, subjective sensation of nasal blockage uh, and objective measurement of decreased airflow are separate things uh, and they don't always overlap. Uh, in fact, I just saw a patient about 45 minutes ago for which uh, this fit perfectly and I quickly put a couple photos in here I'm gonna show you a little later that demonstrate this. So how do we, how do we accurately diagnose and measure pre and post-surgery, how we're doing in these patients. Well, measuring nasal obstruction, uh, and I'm gonna show this also just for review for the residents so you understand a little bit about this. There are three primarily, primary ways of um, measuring nasal obstruction. Okay, there are physical quantitative measurements, uh, which uh, for the residents and fellows you should be familiar with, uh, even though you may not see them uh, here in the clinic. Uh, Physician-derived measures such as examination, uh, severity grades, and so on and so forth. And, you know, the relative newcomer to the scene is uh, our patient uh, uh, outcome measures. Um, so PROMS. Uh, and so these patient-derived measures are increasingly important. Uh, for any of you who've worked with me know that this is one of the main drivers for how I like to measure the outcomes for my patients. And we'll talk a little bit about um, each of these and where things have changed uh, in the past uh, 10 or 15 years. Um, quantitative measures uh, for nasal airflow include acoustic rhinometry, um, rhinomanometry, uh, peak nasal inspiratory flow, uh, which is probably the best. Um, and computational flow dynamics is, is the new kid on the block. And it's not something you can really do in the clinic. That's something you can do with a CT scan and takes days to calculate. It's really not, uh, really shouldn't necessarily be included in there, but I'm including it because it's really probably something that in the future you're gonna hear more about. But the problems with these are that, uh, that first of all, they don't really, they, they look at static, the static nasal airway, they don't really record lateral wall insufficiency and collapse and dynamic changes very well. Uh, and they don't always correlate with findings. So the question is, uh, and if we were here at 801, I would ask you guys to give me some answers, but how well do subjective descriptions of the sensation of nasal airflow essentially agree with objective measures uh, of nasal geometry and airflow? And um, the answer to that question is generally quite poorly. Uh, and this has been uh, shown multiple times in the literature. Uh, and I think probably uh, the the best study was a study that uh, came out of the University of Washington. And for me, it was really a sort of a, um, an eye opener. And it's something that I, I like to cite quite often. Um, and it came from Ed Weaver. And when I was on faculty there, he was on, he's still on faculty at University of Washington, a real bright guy. Um, and he compared um, qualitative, quantitative measures of nasal obstruction to qualitative or the nose score. Now we'll talk about this patient recorded uh, outcome measure um, the nose in a little bit, uh, it is probably the gold standard for nasal obstruction. And that's shown on the, the left side on the, on the y-axis. And I, I labeled it there just so you understand, a worse is a higher score and, and a lower score is better. So it's directly related to symptomatology. So the worst symptoms you're having, the worst score you're gonna give. And on the bottom we have nasal peak flow. Uh, and so good flow is better, right? So on the right, you have better flow, on the left, you have worse. So what would you expect to see uh, you know, if in a perfect world, if symptoms correlated with nasal airflow, you'd expect to see something like this. Uh, and with an R, you know, less than one and um, this nice correlation uh, here. So the issue is that uh, this is actually not the data from the paper. This is a Photoshopped image that I created for illustrative purposes for you to make the point that this isn't what you see. This is actually what you see. Uh, and um, this, this paper, I highly suggest you take a look at. Uh, it's a, it's, to me, again, like I said, it's a, it's a real, uh, real important one. Um, and even though it's 14 years old now, uh, it's, it really started uh, you know, several investigators looking at this and they've all corroborated something similar that subjective and objective don't always agree. Now, why do these uh, physical measures and even the physical exam correlate so poorly uh, with subjective symptoms? Um, I guess 
it underscores the fact that we do not yet really understand clearly what the mechanisms for sensation of uh, normal nasal airflow are. Um, we really are just starting to understand what, what's going on in these, uh, in these patients and our patients in that, in that sense. These are images I took about an hour ago, hour and 15 minutes ago with Zoe, if she's on here. And I saw this patient today that illustrates this perfectly. This, this uh, gentleman came in and sorry, I'm not, a, you know, I'm not a rhinologist. I'm not used to using scopes anymore and taking good pictures. So I just had Zoe take some pictures of the screen. So what this shows is you look in this gentleman's right nostril and it is 100% occluded. The septum is about 90 degrees uh, to uh, the plane it should be in. Uh, and it's just completely obstructed. You look in the left side and there's an air passage going back. Patient swears up and down that the left side is the bad side. Just, you know, asked multiple ways. No, the left side is the side I can't breathe from. I can breathe fine through the right side. Uh, and, you know, this is something you see fairly frequently. You can see patients postoperatively, you know, and, and uh, J.K.R. and, and, uh, and Zara and, uh, and Peter all know this very well. And you, you look inside their nose, you operate on them, and, and, and JP knows this. You look inside the nose and it just doesn't, you know, what you're seeing just doesn't agree with what, what uh, they're telling you. And it can be frustrating, but the patients aren't lying to you. Uh, they're telling you what they're really sensing. And so what's really happening? Um, this is an interesting paper. And I ran across this as I was kind of getting some thoughts together uh, for this talk. And um, for, the, for the rhinology folks and for anyone interested in nasal surgery, I think it's interesting to read. Um, James Baraniak is actually a rheumatologist. Uh, and this was published in the Thoracic Society Journal. But he wrote a really nice review paper that really drills down into the weeds of what we know, what we don't know about uh, the nasal sensory system. And how sensations attributed to the nasal mucosa are really a highly integrated uh, system that's in interpreted and summed uh, by multiple receptors and neurons inside the nose and sent centrally for processing that leads to perception of what's happening with nasal airflow. Uh, and this type of thing, uh, this type of read is very important, I think, for us, any of us who operate in the nose to kind of read and understand. And it, it's it gives some updated updates on the research that's going on out there. And I think one of the things that was interesting to me, and it'll show up in a couple of the other slides I'm gonna show you, is that this TRMP8 receptor, also known as the menthol receptor, because it, a menthol will stimulate this receptor, is, is, uh, seems to be very important for detecting uh, temperature change uh, inside the nose. And as it turns out, it is highly concentrated uh, along with other receptors in just posterior to the nasal vestibule in the area that we call the valve uh, and in the mucosa on the mucosal side. Separate from that, um, we also are starting to understand from computational flow dynamics uh, that the area of peak mucosal cooling, uh, which occurs in the nose with, with fluid dynamic modeling occurs in that area just posterior to the vestibule. And we don't have to get into the data here too much, but um, you know, because you can try to interpret this the CFD analysis here. But it's really interesting because we understand that mucosal cooling is an important aspect of sensation of normal nasal airflow, and it's especially true in that area just posterior to the vestibule. That happens to be the area that we call the valve. In patients, when you see them and you just lift the upper lateral cartilage slightly, and they get just a tiny bit of airflow through that area, they feel like they're moving massive amounts of air. Uh, and these receptors likely are being activated because of the cooling sensation of air going across the fluid interface. And this is where TRMP8 is highly concentrated. And uh, that's why menthol makes you feel good. So, you know, grandma was right. You put menthol on your chest and you feel better when you have a cold. It's not opening your nose up at all. It's actually giving you the sensation that it's more open. So uh, that's all very interesting stuff. And I think it really points out that we're just starting to understand what's going on from a sensory perspective inside the nose. And there's a lot of mapping that still needs to be done. Um, what about physician-derived measures? You know, I already showed you the examination of that patient that didn't correlate. Septum classifications to me exist and they're not very useful. There are tons of them. To me, it really just matters whether it's anterior or posterior. Uh, and it sort of decides which way I'm gonna do it. I'm not gonna talk about that classification system exists for the turbinates. And that was actually 
Uh, that paper was written by um, a former fellow in the sleep division after he left. Um, I think it's interesting. I don't think it makes a big difference in what you're gonna do for those patients. There's really no great classification system for severity of internal valve narrowing and the external valve has two primary systems, um, one of which is one that, that, uh, that we came up with. And I think it takes, it's good to take a moment and think about the nomenclature um, that we use. Um, graduating from residency uh, 20 years ago this June, um, you know, we learned about the internal valve and the external valve, and there were two treatments. One was a batten graft for external valve, one was a spreader graft for the internal valve, and that was about it. And Mark Constantian is a, is a really nice uh, a man and uh, retiring now as a rhinoplasty surgeon. He's a plastic surgeon, and really a thought leader, um, really a, just a splendid guy to talk to. But he wrote this paper that really was the gold standard and, and, and set, the, set the bar for, you know, how we thought about uh, treating patients. Um, and I think it was great. Uh, the problem is that, you know, there's, there's not just one solution for this problem. And in starting my practice in 2002, doing batten grafts and things, I realized that there are some things that just didn't make sense uh, in terms of the physics of what we were doing uh, and also the pathophysiology uh, of where the collapse was occurring on the lateral nasal wall. So I started talking about something called lateral wall insufficiency. And I don't ever use the term external valve collapse. Uh, and I was talking about this for several years and finally told you need told you know, by several people, you need to publish this idea, which I finally did in 2008, which was uh, several years afterwards, but um, still really the first description of this idea of lateral wall insufficiency instead of external valve collapse. And the fact that there are different zones where this occurs. Um, Zone one is really movement at the scroll region and up above it. Uh, I'll show you a video of that in a second. And uh, it tends to occur with age uh, as the piriform ligament tends to loosen and the bony aperture fades and recedes. Zone two collapse occurs when the lower lateral cartilage is too cephalically oriented. There just isn't enough there or iatrogenically uh, often after uh, rhinoplasty as they've been done in the past. Um, and so this is what zone one lateral wall insufficiency looks like through a scope. Um, we don't usually use the scope. Uh, we just look with a, look inside the nose and have people breathe gently. By the way, it's important just to have them breathe gently, not breathe hard, because we can all get some collapse if we breathe hard enough. It's really about generating negative inspiratory pressure uh, against that lateral wall and overcoming the, the ability of that wall to withstand it. And zone two collapse occurs down towards the nostril. Uh, we created a grading system for this, which was validated also. Uh, and these types of things are allowing us to uh, more precisely think about where the problem is on the lateral nasal wall uh, and how we want to treat it. Uh, and over the years, I've tried a number of things uh, to try to treat lateral wall insufficiency, including radiofrequency. And we published a randomized control trial on that. We looked at bone anchored, bone -anchored sutures. Um, they work really well, but they cause a lot of rotation of the nose. So we settled on using lateral curl strut grafts, uh, which were Jack Gunter's contribution uh, to uh, facial plastic surgery and plastic surgery about 25 years ago uh, in zone one. And in zone two, we use rim grafts, which are a different uh, placement of a graft, smaller, but stabilizing that area. And we're able to, uh, using a case control study, um, look at the effectiveness of these uh, in improving um, subjective symptoms, uh, as well as uh, improving the stability of the wall as measured by LWI scores seen in clinic. So just looking at this really briefly, I don't wanna drill into data too much. Um, we're looking here at, um, in green, zone one lateral wall insufficiency scores. LWI grade is on the left, goes up to three max. And the two groups you see here in the dark is the, is, the, is the case group, which is the group that had some sort of lateral wall reconstruction procedure. In this case, in zone one, lateral curl strut grafting. Uh, and group two is just the, the, the control group, which were cosmetic patients who had no surgery on the lateral nasal wall, no stability uh, done at all. So you can see their scores stay low across the board. And we can see that their scores, uh, the patient's LWI scores improve. That means that the stability of that lateral nasal wall is holding up over time out to one year uh, after surgery. Uh, and this is the cosmetic group again, which really showed no change as you'd expect. 
And over time, the no scores and the, again, the dark bars are the, are the case group, which are the ones that matter, those decrease significantly. So we do have some correlation uh, by more precisely looking at where we're treating these patients between um, uh, physical measure, which is lateral wall insufficiency, treated with lateral curl strut grafting, uh, and um, no score as a subjective measurement. So this is really for the residents and also for the rhinologists to, to kind of help you guys understand how I think about patients with nasal obstruction now. Um, when I, when I see a patient for nasal obstruction, I'm thinking along these lines. Uh, is, the, is the obstruction a dynamic uh, obstruction? In other words, is it movement that's causing something or is it static? And is it medial or is it lateral? Okay, so if you simplify it this way, static uh, obstruction, fixed obstruction, anatomic obstruction, that's medial is typically septal deviation uh, or narrow the, narrowing of the internal valve. And these two are re related because if you have a high septal deviation, it can narrow your valve, right? Um, <clears throat> static, lateral, uh, static lateral obstruction is, is caused by a medialized nasal bone uh, that can be iatrogenic. Uh, it can be post-traumatic. Very rarely is, that, is it uh, congenital. Uh, or it can be inter inferior turbinate hypertrophy. So think of it that way. And then finally, we talked about dynamic lateral wall insufficiency. Uh, we then discuss and examine and see whether it's in zone one or two or both, uh, and whether it's uh, responsive to a modified uh, caudal maneuver. The uh, modified caudal, why is Stanley sexy? I don't know. Uh, the modified uh, caudal maneuver is Important to understand, I'm gonna take a minute just to talk about that because again, this is one of those things that I think gets confused. Um, the modified caudal maneuver, you know, if you, if you lateralize the nasal wall, you can get anybody to feel better. So if you're just trying to document a caudal maneuver for insurance purposes, you can get it in anybody, okay? I would submit to you that anyone here in this talk, if you stick a Q-tip in your nose and lateralize your nasal wall, you're gonna breathe better, even if you don't have a problem now. Uh, so that's really not really, very specific in terms of telling us how we want to treat our patients. Um, what's really important is in patients with dynamic lateral wall insufficiency, using either a curette or a Q-tip, that you place it in the nose and just hold it there and um, kind of uh, prevent it from falling in during normal inhalation. Again, not maximal inhalation, but normal inhalation. If patients feel significantly better when you do that, they will respond well to a lateral wall reconstruction procedure, whether it be the things I described or whatever you wanna do. Um, if they don't, or if they only respond to lateralization, it's unlikely, except in some rare cases, that they're gonna respond well. Those rare cases being recurvature of the lateral cartilage or things like that. But you know, it's really important to do that correctly. And, and um, otherwise you'll overdo this procedure and you'll have unhappy patients who don't really get much improvement from stabilizing that nasal, nasal wall when they really needed lateralization of the nasal wall, which is really tough to do. Uh, medial dynamic um, obstruction is very rare. You know, you see people used to talk about floppy septums and things like that. I've seen this maybe once in, in almost 20 years in practice. So I, I, uh, I don't think that's really something to be too concerned about. Finally, I wanna talk a little bit about um, uh, PROMS and uh, patient reported outcome measures because this has really become a very important part of my practice. Um, and uh, the, the gold standard, as I mentioned earlier when I was talking about Ed Weaver's study is the, the NOSE questionnaire. And it was really um, an important uh, PROM that was developed by Mickey Stewart in coordination with Bevan Yu and, um, and Ed Weaver at the University of Washington while I was there. And um, it's uh, widely used, dozens of papers are on this. It's disease specific for nasal obstruction. It was validated on septoplasty and terminal reduction, but we still just went ahead and used it for functional rhinoplasty. And you know, this, uh, I was lucky because I, I um, kind of jumped on this bandwagon really early as a facial plastic surgeon and uh, published several papers using this, which, um, which kind of helped to launch my career uh, back in the early 2000s. Um, and subsequent to that, we used it after I came to Stanford, we continue to use it. Um, and I think you can do some really interesting things with a, something like this. Um, this is a paper that my fellow in 2010, I think, uh, wrote. Um, 
And we wanted to know if we could sort of understand which populations are identified populations based on their nose scores. And so we took patients that had no nasal obstruction and gave them the nose questionnaire. And we then looked at our, our population of patients with nasal obstruction and using a receiver operating characteristic, you can decide, you can kind of determine what the normal population distributions are and where the split should be. And basically, you know, patients with less than a 30 on the nose score we determined are, are essentially the same as a normal population. In other words, patients who really don't have a disease of nasal obstruction, if you will. Uh, and patients above that are more significantly, have a have significant pathology. Uh, and you can create a classification scheme, a severity classification scale. Why is this useful? Because you, know, you, you counsel patients or family docs and so on. These types of grades are easier for them to understand. If you can tell a patient, uh, I can take you from a severe uh, you know, uh, grade down to moderate or mild, uh, that helps them helps them understand. And if a patient comes in with a score of a 20 after surgery, you can counsel them that they're essentially now the same as people on the street uh, that have no nasal obstruction. So this is an important thing that uh, has been actually used, um, fortunately, by uh, several uh, other researchers as they've, as they've gone forward using the nose uh, scale. Uh, and we went ahead and used it also uh, in looking at cost effectiveness. So PROMS can be useful in guiding policy. And one of my pet peeves uh, has been, um, and it's related to precision medicine, it has been the fact that insurers can dictate to us uh, what we can and can't operate, it on, operate on, even when we can see on examination exactly what the problem is. It's very frustrating, in fact, dealing with something like that right now on a patient who's being denied surgery. And one of the things is they insisted on us using nasal steroids all the time. So we actually did a study uh, looking at uh, severity class for patients at baseline, after corticosteroid spray, and then after surgery. Uh, and if you look at the distributions here on those first two, uh, uh, where it says baseline and after uh, steroid spray, um, the distribution stayed the same. The steroids really didn't make any difference whatsoever. Uh, and then after surgery, uh, they shifted quite significantly into mild and moderate categories. And then if you do a, a quality of life cost analysis on these patients, you can show, and we did in this paper, I'm not gonna show you all that, that there's a significant uh, cost savings actually for patients if they have the surgical procedure versus being delayed with six weeks of steroids. Now, the caveat to that is when you do a cost study, uh, it all depends on which perspective you take. If you take the perspective of the patient, it's one thing. If you take the, patient, the, the perspective of the, um, the insurers, it can be cost effective to deny you know, half of a percent of patient surgery that actually need it because they save so much money by doing so. So this is really the strategy that a lot of insurers use and that's to throw up a lot of hoops and just hope to get some ca surgeries canceled here and there. Uh, and it can really be very cost saving. I say that as an outsider, <laughs> I, I'm just assuming that's a strategy because it seems like the only thing that makes sense to me with what's going on. Um, and then of course they said, well, that cost effectiveness study is fine. You really need to do a randomized controlled trial. And that's what led to uh, me wanting to do this uh, double blind, a randomized controlled trial crossover trial uh, with nasal steroids and saline. And so Shannon, who's uh, of course you guys all know, um, uh, one of our former residents and now is on faculty at the University of Michigan did this really nice study uh, and um, really showed again that the, the steroids just aren't so effective. Um, so what are future directions in functional nasal surgery uh, for us? I do think computational flow dynamics is going to make a big difference for us. Um, it's still too onerous to do. It's very expensive, um, very specialized um, institutions do it. Uh, and it's not something that can be used on a patient to patient basis. This is this patient, this study by uh, uh, John Ree um, showed for the first time that in pre and post-surgical patients, you can show an improvement in heat flux in the area of the vestibule using computational flow dynamics. And this correlates with nose score. So again, like my study on the lateral wall insufficiency, we're starting to move towards having ways of more perhaps precisely treating patients and improving their care. Now, this was a, this was a post hoc study, so they didn't really do anything any differently. They're just showing that improving that flow through that area seems to really improve symptoms. 
so this isn't yet to the point where it's helping us design treatment for patients, but it's, it's one step along the way. Uh, and I just want to give a shout out to JCAR. I saw that JCAR just published a paper, in fact, I think just this month or last month uh, with Zhao, who is the CFD person now at Ohio State, uh, and uh, looking at you know, the empty nose patients and changing airflow uh, in them with, uh, with the uh, lateral wall reconstruction procedures. So that's, that's kind of cool. So in functional nasal surgery, we're trying to improve our ability to diagnose uh, our patients. And you know, compared to where we were 15, 20 years ago, I think we're making some progress. Um, you know, history exam prompts, CFD and other may lead to us understanding exactly where to more accurately uh, go after things inside the nose rather than a blanket approach. Uh, and I think that measurement of function um, with PROMS, you know, is probably the way to go and, and eventually we'll be doing hopefully something that correlates better with our PROMS. Uh, CFD is not something we can really do on a patient to patient basis yet. So we're a little ways away from that. Um, I'm gonna switch gears and talk about the other half of the rhinoplasty equation. And this is where it gets, uh, it gets even more uh, interesting. Um, and that is, how do you measure aesthetics? And, and how, do you, how do you measure beauty in these patients? Well, the norms for what we're taught when we take our boards in otolaryngology and facial plastics were uh, determined 40 years ago and they're probably culturally biased. Um, uh, Dick Good, um, our dear friend who we miss, uh, set uh, Powell and Humphreys out there to, to try to determine this. And they wrote the book that became uh, something that's been quoted in these images are from that book and they're shown over and over. If you see them, they should be attributed to Powell and Humphreys for all the various proportions of the face and so on. But, you know, I, I think that that doesn't necessarily apply. Uh, and I, I very rarely if ever have ever you know, made those measurements in a patient because no two patients will want the same thing even for any given facial form based on their personal experiences, uh, based on their gender identity, based on their, on their uh, racial identity. Um, and how much they may want to change or not change things. So you can never really apply those. So if we don't have a way of applying those, how do we measure our success on the aesthetic side uh, for rhinoplasty? Um, is it the patient's opinion that's most important? Is it social perception? Uh, how many likes they're getting when they put their pictures up? Um, is it surgeon judgment? If I show uh, the patient I showed earlier uh, in the in the talk at a big meeting, you know you'll get 25% of surgeons who pat you on the back, 25% of surgeons who think meh, you know, and 50% who are probably looking at their phones. So uh, how do you how do you determine you know what's good? And we do need to know how to do this in order to more precisely and accurately and uh, treat our patients, so we end up with happy patients. Um, because you know ultimately happy patients uh, make us happy. So from a patient perspective, I think, um, you know, problems again are important. And I think out of those three things, it is the most important. Uh, those other two items will influence your patient's opinion of what, you're, what you did. But ultimately what matters is what they think about it and how happy they are about it. Uh, and so the face cue was developed by Andrea Pusick um, and is a, is a nice, uh, patient reported outcome measure for overall facial aesthetics. And then they developed a module called the face QR for rhinoplasty. Um, the problems I have with it are that the validation on it was not very strong. And as I'll point out to you, validation is everything when it comes to developing a patient reported outcome measure. Um, the questions are not necessarily relevant. It has to do with the way they validated it, I think. Uh, there's no functional component. So that's 50% of the, of the issue there. So if you give this questionnaire, you have to give patients a nose questionnaire as well. And because it's so long, it's really not something that's gonna be easily used by doctors and patients. So it's really not great for us. So um, this is a cautionary tale of, uh, about sticking your neck out and learning new things about clinical research. And you know, I pivoted from basic science to clinical research 18 years ago, and I, I learned new things all the time. And I, uh, I really wanted to develop a patient reported outcome measure that encompassed functional and aesthetic uh, problems uh, and was easy to use. And so uh, my fellow in 2013 or 14, 
um, took this on and we, we came up with a methodology that was based uh, pretty much on the way things were done in the early 2000s when the nose questionnaire was done and other questionnaires. Uh, which was fairly simple um, test retest reliability, Cronbach alpha, things like that. Didn't really need a lot of statistical help on it. And we developed the Rhino questionnaire. I sent it out to JAMA uh, and it was summarily rejected. Um, and I got really good feedback. I was first, of course, you, you take a hit to your ego when that happens. And then I had a really good talk with some of the folks who had seen it and um, realized that you know, to develop a, a problem that's going to be used widely, you need to make sure it is very, very well validated because it is the foundation for what people will use clinically and in research for many years to come. Uh, and while this uh, validation uh, was fine for the early 2000s, it really wasn't up to snuff in terms of what we do psychometrically nowadays. And so I went back to the drawing board and for a couple of years, I was kicking around this idea of what we're gonna do. Um, and, uh, and, you know, as I said, it should, any problem that we develop for rhinoplasty should be functional and aesthetic. It should be very strongly validated and easy to use. And so um, in 2016, I had a very eager fellow who wanted to take a crack at this when I, I brought it up with every fellow when they came through. Uh, and I actually sent um, Sami Mubayed to a meeting in Washington, DC that was just dedicated to patient report and outcome measure development. He made a lot of good contacts and really, this was like in July or August of that year. And we came up with a, a plan that was more rigorous to develop something that would be, um, that would be very strong. And that was to uh, develop a framework for um, understanding exactly what the most important issues are around rhinoplasty, developing a preliminary questionnaire, doing item reduction, uh, and then a psychometric evaluation and field testing. And this is a, uh, the conceptual framework for this, uh, which is actually a figure from the paper, which ended up being in JAMA, uh, JAMA Facial Plastics. And there, you know, turns out there are four key areas that came up uh, in our discussions with rhinoplasty experts and um, dozens and dozens of patients that we interviewed prior to even undertaking this. Overall cosmesis, specific cosmesis of specific areas of the nose, social perception of the nose, um, and, uh, nasal obstruction, various aspects. And so you go through this and then um, we had the fortune of having uh, identified two people to collaborate with us who are both world famous in this field. One is John Ioannidis, who's here at Stanford, who's now since become uh, uh, well known for his um, rather, uh, how shall I say it? Um, well, different take on, uh, on getting herd immunity going uh, with COVID, he, he published that paper last year that was somewhat controversial. Uh, and uh, Mikhail Saltichev, who we're very lucky to find is a brilliant um, psychometrician, expert in prom development, uh, who's uh, in Finland uh, and is a PM&R physician. He actually gave grand rounds to the PM&R department here a couple of years ago uh, and I had the chance to meet him after we'd already collaborated. So this is the, this is the problem that we came up with. Uh, and you guys have seen us use it in clinic. I think uh, JP uses it too. Uh, and I'm proud to say it's been translated into 10 plus languages It's used around the world uh, and, uh, and uh, being recommended for use uh, because of its ease of use and strength in validation. Um, going back, so there's two, different, the, there's two different categories here. There's a functional domain and the aesthetic domain. Sorry, I wanted to say that. Now I'm gonna pivot a little bit uh, because I want to talk a little bit about um, psychiatric disease in the rhinoplasty patient and the challenges this, this gives us, and then circle back to the, to the prom. Now, we know that mental health disorders such as depression, anxiety, BDD, and so on occur in the cosmetic population at much higher rates than the general population. Estimated rates as high as 20%. Uh, BDD in the rhinoplasty population can be 43%, uh, up to 43% if you look at uh, different studies. So the question is how to screen, how to cancel, uh, how to not how to cancel, how to counsel. Um, you don't want to cancel all these patients because that would be you know 50% of the patients that come in the office. But you want to know which ones are not going to do well as a result of this, um, no matter how uh, good a job you do with your surgery. Um, and so we uh, wanted to know uh, if our prom would allow us to help screen patients uh, for BDD. Now, we didn't really want to give everybody a BDD questionnaire. Uh, just giving so many questionnaires is hard on patients. 
Um, and so we did a small prospective study where we gave a number of psychiatric screening tools, including the BDDQAS, which is a short BDD questionnaire. Uh, and we found in our group that we had 32% screen positive for BDD. These are patients coming in for uh, functional, uh, combined functional aesthetic or aesthetic uh, rhinoplasty. And as you can see, various other aspects of uh, mental, mental health issues. Now, anxiety and depression, you know, they're fairly common. Uh, but the BDD, 32% um, of our patients, about a third of our patients uh, were positive for BDD. Uh, and it turns out that three of the questions were, were highly correlated, most highly correlated with BDD uh, on that. And so when patients score a little bit higher on these, your radar goes up and you think, well, uh, I need to spend a little extra time with these patients talking about motivations. I need to spend a little, spend a little extra time with these patients asking how they think perhaps uh, a rhinoplasty will change their life. Um, and you'd be surprised at the answers that you get. And this will help you uh, if you're doing rhinoplasty, um, avoid situations where you regret having operated on somebody. And counsel patients, you know, it's really about them too. I mean, it's not just about you. You wanna, you wanna do something that's gonna create happiness. Um, and uh, the last thing you wanna do is set someone down the path of multiple revisions and unhappiness and so on. And we've seen those patients. Most studies or virtually every study that I've seen up to this point had looked at the proportion of patients seeking plastic surgery that had psychiatric disease. Um, and I was interested in the opposite. Uh, I was interested in understanding what proportion of patients with psychiatric disease end up getting plastic surgery in comparison to the non-psychiatric disease population. Uh, and so with the tools that we have available um, with the Truven or IBM Market Scan uh, record database, we can look at uh, many records. And so we actually did a, a study with Kristen and, and Emily as did the last study, where we looked at over a million records and created cohorts uh, which were matched for comorbidities, okay? that had either no psychiatric diagnosis or psychiatric diagnosis. I'm not getting into the weeds of all the different CPT or ICD codes, but we used several. Uh, and then what the incidence of plastic surgery procedures were uh, in each cohort and created odds ratios for what those were. And again, this is where I might ask you if we were all together, what do you think those odds ratios look like? Um, and we also looked at complication rates too, by the way. Well, the odds ratios, if you have a history of depression, uh, getting a plastic surgery procedure within one year are essentially two. Uh, and a BDD is the highest, uh, three. So this puts you at risk, if you will, of, of undergoing a plastic surgery procedure. The caveats to this are, this database um, underrepresents the number of plastic surgery procedures happening because it's only in the insured uh, population. So I, I, I think it'd actually be even higher if you could look at all the patients undergoing cosmetic surgery that aren't being coded and putting, put into this database. Um, so these patients also, uh, again, matched comorbidities. These patients also had higher rates of complications. I don't know how to wrap my head around that. And I'm not just talking about revisions, but also just infections and other problems. So how does that, how does that jive? I'm not sure I understand that, but this is really what I wanted to understand uh, more. And it really helps us you know, think patients um, are seeking our help for, for reasons that may be more than just the physical ones that you see. And so you have to be thinking about that uh, when you see a patient that wants to change the form of their face in some fashion. So can we use the, can we use the schnoz to predict outcomes for our patients? Uh, this is a, a nice study that was recently published um, by Tyler and George, uh, who both did a great job in this, and Priyash, of course, helped out. We wanted to know if, <clears throat> excuse me, any particular single question could predict whether patients got revision rhinoplasty surgery with me. And so we found out that with this question number five, if you scored a zero, one, two, or three in this, in this retrospective study of about 170 patients, I think it was, or 150, um, if you scored a one, two, or a three, you had a 0% chance of getting a needing a revision or wanting a revision or getting a revision by me 
later. Now, before you think, okay, well, this is just a severity issue, we match them for severity of the rest of their score. So it isn't a proxy. You know, if you got a four or five, you had a much higher rate of revision, 17 to 19%, overall revision rate of 6%. Um, it's, not a, it's not a proxy for having higher scores or worse disease severity. Um, so we did a statistical analysis to make sure that wasn't the case. So this is really interesting. So if your overall nasal self-esteem, if you will, is low, if you have a high degree of distress emotionally from what's going on with your nose, you're more likely to do poorly uh, with the surgery. And if you look at the scores of the, the schnoz over time, patients who had zero, one, two, or three actually got happier over time. They actually, their scores went down. Uh, and if you looked at the other ones, every month that passed, they actually felt worse about it. Uh, and so, you know, perhaps it's perseverating over things, uh, who knows, but it's just progressively patients did worse. And so, you know, again, taking this down as a whole, you have to think about those scores on that question when you see your patients. And I think it's helping us understand uh, perhaps what we can do to meet their expectations uh, when they come in the door, whether we're gonna be able to meet them or not. I'm not saying if somebody comes in with a five, we shouldn't operate on them. I'm saying perhaps you need to spend more time counseling them and talking to them. And before you decide to do surgery on them, make sure you really understand where they're coming from. So what about expectations? Um, you know, this equation is just so universal. Happiness is reality minus expectations. So this is what, you know, we were told as residents when we would complain about our 120 hours we were working and stuff, you know, just have lower expectations. I'm not saying that's right, but expectations um, are what we, are really dealing with in these patients. Happiness is what you want as a surgeon and you want for your patient. Reality is what you can achieve. And you're the one who decides that, not the patient. Uh, and expectations are what they're hoping for. Um, I thought a lot about this the first 10 years in practice and came up with this equation. And actually we published this in the Aesthetic Surgery Journal. Uh, it's not just the patient's expectations, but there's actually this other factor uh, and that is the influence of other people on that patient's expectations, uh, what the patient visualizes, plus whatever significant others, family members and others, how they influence that patient. Uh, and um, I should add uh, here social media likes because that's, <laughs> that's come up since I came up with this. You know, the influence of social media and how a patient feels about their self-esteem, how many likes they're getting when they post their selfies after they have surgery with you is gonna have an effect. Um, and the real important factor here is lambda. Uh, if that lambda value, that influence level is zero, they're very strong-minded uh, and stable and they don't really get influenced by that other stuff, then it doesn't matter what's going on. That outside noise doesn't matter. But if it's, if it's high, uh, then the influence level of people around them will, you know, pointing out imperfections or not giving them enough love is gonna have a big influence on how happy they are and their expectations afterwards. So we actually um, just recently published a study looking at expectations. Uh, and I wanted to understand how well we're doing meeting expectations for our patients. And you know, the, the reason we did this was actually the clinical practice guidelines published by Travis Tullison and Lisa Ishii set this out as one of the things that really needed to be done uh, in the literature. And we're, I think the first ones to look at this. Um, and so we, looked at functional aesthetic and combined functional aesthetic patients, asked them about what their expectations were for how well they're gonna be able to breathe through their nose and how happy they thought they would be with, this, with their nose shape afterwards. Uh, and then afterwards asked them how satisfied they were. Uh, and the findings are, are kind of interesting. Um, for the functional only patients, so these are patients not undergoing any aesthetic surgery, on the left side of the screen, you have the Schnaz O objective scores like the nose scores and the Schnaz C scores. Um, and these are basically disease severity levels, all significantly better, okay? So the function's improved, cosmesis improved. Why is that a bleed over effect? Um, maybe they got a little straighter when I straightened out their septum, I don't know. When you look at their satisfaction scores also, cosmetic expectations weren't high, so those were easily met because we didn't expect to change anything and functionally, also very satisfied. Now, 
this actual paper has tons and tons of tables on it. I've kind of simplified things here for you so we can understand it more easily. If you look at the cosmetic only patients, their function showed no change, okay, on the Schnoz O. And if you looked at their disease severity on the Schnoz C, the distress levels, they were significantly improved. So you think these patients have got to be really pretty happy. If you look at their expectations on obstruction, they're met. They weren't expecting much because they didn't have obstruction. But if you look at their cosmesis satisfaction, it's just not, not quite, not quite what they were expecting, or that's not, they're not quite as satisfied as they expected to be if you look back at what they wrote before surgery. Uh, if you look at the combined functional aesthetic patients, it's the same pattern, okay? And it's sort of mixed in the, on the cosmetic satisfaction as you might expect. At some time points they're satisfied, they meet the same expectations and at some time points they don't. So the overall pattern here is that in cosmetic only patients and combined cosmetic functional patients, we did really well from a disease severity standpoint. Um, if you look at Schnauz C's, if you just look at the PROM scores, but if you actually ask them and compare what they expected to get before surgery with what they wrote for the satisfaction afterwards, we weren't meeting it. So why is that uh, the case? Um, let me give you a diagrammatic example of what's happening here. So this is the Schnauz C on the top and suppose somebody wrote those scores uh, for what, you know, what bothered them, how they were mostly worried about the straightness of their nose. You can see their shape of the nose from the side and so on. And if you ask them before surgery, they expected to be 99% satisfied afterwards. Uh, and so we give them that at their pre-op and they fill it out. After surgery, those scores are all significantly lower. If you do a statistical analysis, okay, they're significantly improved. Um, but as you can see, the straightness of the nose isn't perfect. Things aren't quite perfect. And the patient isn't completely satisfied. They put down you know, 80% or something instead of the 99 that they had hoped for. Um, and it doesn't happen on the functional side. It only happens on the cosmetic side. So why is that? Well, the first thing you're thinking is, well, it's because he's not very good. That's the first thing I was thinking, okay. You know, it's a single, this is a single, uh, single surgeon, single institution study. Okay, so there's that. Is a methodological thing with the way we designed the study possible? I think, I think that we designed the questions such that we would be able to extract this information. As I said, there's a high incidence of BDD in this population. This could be influencing things. Patients are paying a lot of money out of pocket. Their expectations could be through the roof. Uh, and the one that I find most interesting uh, is that we are presenting preoperative stimuli to these patients that set their expectations. And when we wrote this paper, I spent a lot of time going into the psychology literature, which by the way, you can't find on PubMed, you have to do other searches. And it turns out there's this top-down theory uh, for perception in psychology. And the idea is that perception can be influenced by data presented before a stimulus. Uh, and what that means for me is that we present a stimulus before, uh, before surgery for the cosmesis, but not for function. We show them you know, simulations of what we think we might be able to do. Uh, and when you look at their, I forgot, there actually is one, another before and after. Here's a before and after. So this is a patient's actual photo. She's actually a very happy patient, but there's differences between that image and the, and the, and the uh, simulation. Uh, and it could be that in these patients, we're setting expectations psychologically, even subliminally very high with these, even though we tell them these aren't guarantees of results. Now, Am I going to stop doing this? Absolutely not. Uh, because as, as JP knows, this is a great way to screen patients for things like BDD and uh, unreal expect, expectations. So you really need to do this. This is an important part of communicating with your patients. And I tell them up and down, this isn't a guarantee. And they all say they understand that. But I need to know, you know how realistic they are about what we can do. Um, but this is something that's different than what we do for the functional patients. We don't simulate for them how well they're going to be able to breathe afterwards. We can't. Uh, and it's possible that this is part of the reason. And I like to think that this is at least part of the reason for these patients. So um, I'm going to wrap things up a little bit here. You know, what are the next steps? What are the next steps for us? Uh, I've sort of summed for you my perspective on functional nasal surgery and the shortcomings of the way we diagnose uh, 
and measure nasal obstruction in our patients. Uh, and what things I've done as part of my career to try to tr improve that and others have done. Uh, and I hope to continue to do that. Um, we may uh, start getting involved in computational flow uh, dynamic analysis or other things to, uh, to understand uh, more about critical areas inside the nose. Other research groups are already doing that. I've talked to our people in engineering here at Stanford and they may, there may be some interest. Um, and understanding most importantly areas to preserve. I think we need to develop a, um, a map inside the nose of where all the various receptors are. And I think we'll understand more about what's critical to preserve in these patients in terms of the airway when we do cosmetic surgery as well. From an aesthetic point of view, I've, I've spent a lot of time talking about the psychology of these patients because the fact of the matter is I learned early on that you could do the perfect rhinoplasty and have the perfect looking result and they could be really unhappy. Um, I stayed away from talking to you about technical aspects of rhinoplasty uh, because I don't think that's what you'd want to hear about. I think that some of these other things are more interesting and you may find that some of these psychological aspects of patient satisfaction uh, correlate with things that you do in whatever aspect of otolaryngology you practice. Um, I think it's important that we communicate really uh, effectively with our patients about outcomes and possibilities. Um, and finally, understanding who is not a good candidate for surgery is key. We all know the old saying that we never really regret um, having not operated on somebody, or very rarely, uh, but I definitely regret having operated on a few patients over the years. And it's not just a selfish thing because of the sleep lost on my part, but it's also because I genuinely feel bad for putting the patient down that pathway of unhappiness. And it's really all about, um, again, precision medicine, right? We're really trying to understand more precisely exactly how to treat these patients. And it's complex. I hope you get appreciation now for the complexity of understanding function, treating function in our patients, both surgically and, and, and whatnot, and also uh, the aesthetic side. And again, all these patients have both of these issues going on. Uh, and you need to really think about both of them and all of your patients. So uh, it's been about an hour now. I thank you very much for your time. And um, I guess if we take Zoom questions, I'll take some Zoom questions. So thank you. Hey, Sam, that was a great talk. A um, couple of things I wanted to mention and follow up. Um, I just recently reviewed a study of a uh, facial nerve center in Europe. It's pretty high volume. And their rate of body dysmorphia using a lot of different metrics was 20%. So yeah. it's very highly prevalent across every like little sub discipline. You know, it's, it's not just a rhinoplasty thing, obviously it's just uh, very common. The schnoz is a really great instrument and uh, I do use it. And I was wondering from your perspective, what it, a great instrument that is developed and is very useful. What happens to it in 10 years? Like kind of, you know, like, because as then, you get tons of experience with it, despite the initial high level of validation. Mm -hmm. You know, if you kind of look in the future, what do things get added to it? Does something eventually replace it? Like what, you know what I mean? If for everybody. Yeah, I, I, that's a great question. And, and that actually is exactly why I didn't start using the Rhino questionnaire, even though I got it published in a lesser journal. Um, I didn't want to start using it because it's really the foundation for what we are going to do for several years. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. The nose questionnaire is still going strong. If you look back at the validation on it, it's not so great. There are questionnaires like the rhinoplasty outcomes evaluation, which was also a UW creation, which was, uh, which was done just with a simple Cronbax alpha that's being used. It's just an aesthetic questionnaire. And it really shouldn't be used. Whenever I review a paper that has it, I say you really shouldn't be using this because it's poorly validated and it, the results don't really mean a lot. It could be that the bar gets raised even higher in 10 years in terms of how validation should be done. Mm -hmm. I like to think that ours is gonna really last a, a while in that way. I think that the, um, one of the things that, that is a uh, shortcoming, if you will, is that it, it is kind of short. It is only 10 questions. We really uh, wanted it to be relatively brief and not like three pages long. So you can't, you can't really drill down too much in the data about very, very specific things about the nose, but you know, the, when we did the, um, the, the uh, drilling down on the questions we wanted to keep in it, we did the statistical analysis on it, it actually ended up with 10. We started out with like 25 and it ended up just at 10 as we're clearly the ones that work the best in our, um, in our field testing. Um, so it just kind of worked out to be an even number like that. 
Sam, this is Ahmed. I really enjoyed your talk scientifically and also spiritually. I mean, this what, what you said applies to a lot of different fields. It's just a lot of the stuff that you mentioned that can apply to otology and many other fields as well. And for sure, there's been a lot of patients that we all have regret who have, we've operated on no matter what the procedure. Yeah. And uh, it's to be able to scientifically reach that is really amazing. And I just wanted to congratulate you. It was an amazing talk. I really enjoyed oh, it. Thanks. I appreciate it. I'm glad you found it somewhat useful. I thought it'd be more useful than just talking about how to do a better you know, tip surgery or something like that. No, I think this applies across all, uh, all fields, really. Yeah. And I see that Charian's on this call. I just want to point out, you know, Charian is uh, my right-hand person and really was responsible for a lot of the productivity we've had. And he's an amazing researcher. I see his, uh, his image there. So Charian, thank you for everything. Um, you know, I was thinking about, I, I was going to make this analogy at the beginning of the talk. I forgot when I was talking about how we have to balance form and function. I, I was going to say, imagine if you were doing a middle ear reconstruction, but you're also going to be judged on how beautiful it was afterwards as well as how well the patient can hear. Yeah, exactly. I, mean, <laughs> I usually tell patients after exostosis removal, I said, don't look at the ear. We're not trying to make the ear look beautiful. We're just trying to make it work beautifully. Right, right. Well, I appreciate everyone uh, coming on board and hanging out. Uh, thanks, JP, for the, the questions. And uh, if anybody has any other comments, or I'm gonna check the chat, actually. I think there's a chat here. Yeah, nothing there. Okay, so if anyone has any questions later about this stuff or if any of the residents want to get involved with some of the stuff, just let me know. And thanks again for, uh, for hanging out, guys. Have a great night.